So uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Alessio Lamiano from Recover Ingredients, and we research, develop, and produce innovative materials from the circular economy of food byproducts that are able to replace materials flagged over health and environmental concerns in the cosmetic and in the agricultural sectors. This presentation then will be divided in two parts, one on circular cosmetics and one on circular agronomics. Okay, let's start with the first part. So today's consumer awareness is at its historical peak. This awareness is particularly strong in cosmetics, where the demand for green and natural product is always growing. To meet this demand, cosmetic companies are constantly looking to replace synthetic ingredients in their formulation with new and natural ones. Paradoxically, for some of the most critical ingredients, such replacement is very difficult due to the lack of natural alternatives. This is the case of sun care products, where the active ingredients, the so-called UV filters, are considered dangerous for human health by FDA and AHA. According to this agency, three out of four sunscreen on the market contains chemicals potentially, potentially dangerous for our health. These chemicals are also toxic for the environment, especially on coral reef, as you can see from the picture on the corner. And this pollution, several nations to ban the use of sunscreen and sunblocks from their territory. Another ingredient uh, in nutrient need of replacement is microplastic. We're talking here about small plastic particles intentionally added in personal care products as technical ingredients. From 2020, AHA banned from Europe microplastic in the cosmetic sectors, for obvious reason, I guess. My reckon is there. And it is thinking to enlarge this restriction to all synthetic polymers by 2025. We are talking of a huge number of ingredients in need of a quick replacement here, for which, for which there is not yet a valid natural and sustainable alternative. So differing from micro, microscopic plastic wastes like barrels or bags floating on water surface, UV filters, microplastics, synthetic polymers in cosmetics are invisible. But as in the case of iceberg, where the underwater invisible parts is much larger than the visible one, they are much bigger threat to our health and to the environment, especially to the, to the marine environment that is the sink of all these chemicals. Moreover, it's in the marine environment that these invisible pollutants contain cosmetic can damage precious ecosystem like coral reef and bioaccumulate along the trophic chain to get back to us as food. So this is why at Recovering Ingredients, we research, develop, and produce natural cosmetic ingredients from the circular economy of marine biomasses. In one sentence, our philosophy is from the sea to the sea for the health of the consumers. Our material, in fact, merge high eco and biocompatibility with a safety profile in line with the most stringent international standards and with high cosmetic performances. There is another reason that pushed us to use marine biomass and is that great part of it is neglected from valorization processes. Let's consider fish as an example. Only the 40% of fish is consumed as food, while the 60% is made of byproducts that go to the pet and feed industry. But in this byproduct, there is a great quantity, up to 100 kilograms each ton of fish, of high purity minerals, high purity calcium phosphate that got completely wasted, is dumped because it has no nutritional value. So it doesn't make sense to feed animals with that. Similar things happen with seashells, okay? In the case of seashells, the byproducts are not marketable shell, seashells uh, with a broken shell or small or long time dead that go directly in the, in the landfill. This means that for each ton of seashell, you have once again a high purity mineral, in this case, calcium carbonate, of which, which is the main constituent of, uh, of the shells that go completely wasted. But why do I say wasted? Why do I insist on that? Because both synthetic calcium phosphate and calcium carbonate are already employed in the cosmetic field, so with a very high added value application. That's why we developed and patented our first product, Marine Boost, a photoprotective calcium phosphate extracted from fish bone, able to boost the sun protection factor of any sun block. We have already used this ingredient in several formulations, and our test showed that Marine Boost is capable of increasing the SPF factor of a formulation from medium to high, at the same time decreasing the amount of UV filters in it. The second product we have developed is sea powder that is produced extracting calcium carbonate from marine shells with a high level of purity of gold. Definitely higher than the one extracted from ore deposit, as an example. This material can be used as technical ingredient to replace synthetic polymers in cosmetic products. And we are constantly testing its cosmetic performances in formulation. So the TRL is a bit lower in this case. 
The market of recovery ingredients with these two pro of these two products to be more specific is the global market of cosmetic products. And our target is the UV filter synthetic polymer sectors that combine have a pretty big share of the market of cosmetic ingredients with a 5% CAG over the last three years. With our first three products, of course, Marine Boost and Sea Powder, we aim to get a share of the 1% of this market at the end of year five. So where do we want to start? Well, we look globally, but we think globally, but we want to act locally. In this regard, let me say that Italy is a great place to start a business in the cosmetic sector, as it is leader in the production of cosmetics with a very high number of subcontractors. Just think that in this red circle here in this area, there are 450 companies generating each year revenues over 4 billion, and that every year they spend a considerable amount of money, I'm sorry, considerable amount of money in research and development of uh, new products to innovate the products, having consumer perception and new regulatory rules as principal drivers. So this was the first part of, the, of my speech. So let's now move on the second part, of the presentation, the one on materials with agricultural application. Using the same approach already illustrated for the cosmetic field, we have developed natural ingredients for the agricultural sector in this case, always starting from wastes from the food industry, from food byproducts. A little bit of background also in this case, the world population has witnessed a population boom over the last uh, 50 years, according to Food and, uh, to, to, um, food and Agriculture Organization. By 2060, the population on the planet will exceed 10 billion people. This will put food production system under pressure like never before. In the first place, of course, the agricultural sector, which, uh, which is our primary source of food. But to be honest, the agricultural sector has been under pressure for over the last 50 years by now. And now this increase in production has come about by resorting to intensive agriculture, which is enormous quantities of fertilizers. And here comes a real problem because intensive farming waste is a lot of fertilizer and is very inefficient from the point of view of mass flows. This is evident if we look at the global trends of nutrient use efficiency. This is the efficiency with which plants use fertilizers. Over the last 50 years, the efficiency has dropped and we have been facing the consequences of this drop. Deforestation, intensive use of agrochemicals, algal blooms, these are all problems causing from the intensive use of fertilizer, where a particular role is played by phosphorus. Phosphorus is one of the three main uh, primary nutrients of plants. Why is it is so critical, phosphorus? Well, the first reason is that half of the, worth of the world's agricultural soils are deficient in this element. Therefore, it's not possible to grow anything without using pea-based fertilizers, phosphorus-based fertilizers. Second problem is that phosphorus resources are disappearing, are non-renewable bound. Phosphorus, phosphorus is extracted from ore deposit, okay? And the peak of phosphorus production is already expected for 2030. But in the recent past, the price of, the price of phosphorite, the mineral from which phosphorus is extracted, has already experienced strong increases, like in 2008, when the price of this mineral grew by 70% in just 14 months, leading some nations like China to impose a huge export tariff on phosphorus. Furthermore, much of the phosphorus sold in, in the world comes from one country, Morocco. This obviously creates a strong dependence for countries like, like those of the um, European Union, which have very little local resources of this element. So it is of fundamental importance to develop a circular economy of phosphorus. In this respect, the main phosphorus reached by products are three. There are three streams, manure, sewage sludge, and biomass from animal slaughter and the food industry. What is the difference among, uh, between these three sources of phosphorus? Well, the first is the quantity that is already recycled. If you can see from this chart, the quantity that we already recycled of manure is almost 100%. Very good in that, okay? Sewage sludge, 40%. Meat and bone, very, very low. Up to six, just a 6%. Second most important difference and makes this um, difference in quantity already recycled even more uh, critical is the content of phosphorus on dry matter. Manure, very low uh, phosphorus content, just one to 2%. Sewage sludge, almost the same. Meat, bone meal, up to this 15%, five times higher, okay? There is also another point to take in consideration that meat and bone meal are an high purity source of phosphorus. 
Okay, so very low contents of contaminants, especially uh, heavy metals in, in this case. Okay, but why bones differently from manure are not recycled in agriculture? Simply because like dinosaur fossils, their degradation is very slow. And so is the release of phosphorus, which therefore remains not available for plants. Okay, this is why the vast majority of animal bones are incinerated to ashes that in turn have an additional problem. In fact, phosphorus remains in the ashes and one part of it is extremely soluble and is quickly washed out by rains from the soil and cause pollution problems like water contamination, algal blooms and things we already see. The remaining part is highly insoluble. And if you give them to the plant, you feed plant with them, this phosphorus enduring the soil, leading to a progressive loss of soil quality. Once again, an environmental problem. So we developed and patented the SMART-P, a material obtained from the conjugation of calcium phosphate, both synthetic or natural, with humic acid, also this one, synthetic or natural. SMART-P is a phosphorus-based ingredient for the production of MPK fertilizers that holds the ability to release phosphorus in a time fashion manner, exactly when the plants needed it. The coating of humic acid, in fact, is able to mobilize the phosphorus of the bones in the soils and makes it bioavailable for the plants. Moreover, thanks to the coating of humic acids, MARP interacts positively with the plant and modulate the release of nutrients according to the vital cycle of the plant itself. If you don't trust my words, trust numbers. We performed several experiments and our greenhouse experiment on corn plants showed that SMART-P gives much better performance than traditional pea fertilizer at half the concentration. In this case, the comparison is with a product while used in agriculture, superphosphate. You can see the bar here in red of superphosphate. The green one is one of our synthetic roxyapatite, not performing, not, not bad at all, but of course, SMART-P that are all the other bars, all SMART-P engineered in different way with humic acid, they will give much better results. We made an additional experiment. Uh, more, please, Alessio. What, sorry? One minute. Ah, okay, thank you. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm almost done, thank you. Uh, in the last experiment I'm showing you, salt was added to the soil to put corn plants under water and sanitary stress. In this condition, the difference between biomass seals obtained with SMART-P and with a traditional fertilizer, fertilizer are even more evident. This means that SMART-P can work in condition where using traditional fertilizers fertilizer, you will have no growth of plants, zero, nil, null, okay? So it was a, a, a big achievement. Well, the market of uh, SMART-P is the specialty fertilizer market, but I, I wanna uh, move over to talk about uh, our um, an, another application of our materials that to us is very important. That is the one uh, material for photo protection of plants due to climate change, as an example. Um, one producer in Northern Italy, France, Spain, and other parts of the world have huge need of product capable to protect the vineyard during the hot season. In fact, it should be considered that the frequency of heat waves that are already causing huge grip and money losses will double by 2050. This is why we, do, we can use calcium carbonate to protect not only grapes, but also fruit from um, sunburns, okay? So very last slide, our roadmap. We are a CNR spin-off. We got two patents pending. We prove our materials. We got recently the CNR approval to found our company. We are actually in a very delicate uh, moment we go, because we are negotiating a deal with a big, uh, uh, large chemical company. Once we will do that, we will get over that. Yes, thank you. We will then um, set up our pilot plant and then we will start the certification and production, certification and distribution of our material. So I would like to thank um, all the partners that, uh, that supported our um, trail by now, our uh, voyage. And of course, thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much.